Hello, I'm John. Welcome to Chinese Crimes, a channel dedicated to real-life cases in China. I believe that those who watch this video are very passionate about detective stories and crime cases. So, do you believe in justice? Surely you can't help but feel relieved or excited when the perpetrator of a case is brought to light and punished for their actions. Because in your mind, the victims are extremely pitiful, having their futures and even lives taken away from them. However, sometimes exceptions occur. Both the perpetrator and the victim have their own hidden sides. So who is the most pitiful in today's story? On the afternoon of March 15, 2008, a railway security guard was conducting a check along the Kunshan railway line. At that moment, a plastic bag lying on the roadside grass caught his attention. But when the security guard opened the bag, a horrific scene unfolded before his eyes. Inside was a head covered in blood. The head was so severely injured that the white skull was visible. This sight terrified him, and he quickly reported it to the police. The police immediately rushed to the scene upon receiving the report. But after thorough investigation, they only found two skull fragments, one large and one small nearby, and no other body parts were found. In this case, the police concluded that this was not the first crime scene, nor was it a suicide or a traffic accident on the train. It was undoubtedly a homicide and body disposal. So who is the murderer behind this? Who killed and handled the body so brutally? The police began to investigate eagerly, but the evidence at the scene was very limited, with only a head and two skull fragments found, nothing else. Is this one of those cases where the perpetrator can never be found? Will the Chinese police be stuck in a deadlock like this? Around 4 p.m. on the same day, a team of criminal investigators and technicians from Shanghai quickly arrived at the scene. After several surveys of the environment near the railway area, the basic investigation team determined the method of body disposal by the suspect, throwing the victim's head from the train. This was based on the perpetrator's perspective. Usually, if they want to destroy evidence, they must hope to throw it as far as possible, and the location should be somewhere with trees for cover. But this body part was found very close to the railway track. If thrown from a truck, it certainly couldn't be that close, except for the case where the space for throwing was too narrow, making it difficult for the perpetrator to use force. So, the window on the train was the appropriate position under these conditions. But it also raised a new question. Because railway security is very strict, how did the suspect avoid security checks and openly carry a human head onto the train? There were many small human skin fragments and blood stains on the railway track. These traces were linked to a 43-meter stretch. The assessment was made based on the rolling direction caused by the train's inertia. This head was thrown from a train carrying passengers from Shanghai. To further clarify this conclusion, technicians conducted an experiment. They took a sheep's head and threw it out of the window of a high-speed train. They found that the trajectory and landing state of the sheep's head matched the prediction. The police focused on investigating 57 relevant trains. However, these 57 trains were related to dozens of cities and nearly 50,000 passengers. Investigators checked surveillance videos from many stations along the railway line for the past two days, but unfortunately, they did not find anyone carrying a black plastic bag into the station or any related individuals in the surveillance videos. In the investigation, identifying the victim's identity is extremely important and considered a prerequisite for handling a case. It can narrow down the suspect for a more accurate investigation. That's why the victim's body parts were examined to determine their identity. However, what the police found was only a part of the body that was no longer intact. Even the skull was broken into two pieces. So could the police accomplish what seemed impossible? And fortunately, the police did. They invited Zhang Tan, one of the first criminal investigation experts appointed by the Ministry of Public Security, who can recreate the appearance of a criminal suspect through the memories of witnesses. And he has never failed in over 20 years as a police officer. More than 800 criminals have been arrested thanks to the portraits drawn by him. During this time, many major cases shocked the country, and he became known as the detective with the magic pen. The reason why his portraits can completely reproduce the appearance of a person is due to his excellent painting skills and meticulous study of human facial features. Of course, restoring skulls and faces is also part of his expertise. After years of research, he mastered the technology of skull restoration, 
also known as brain pan reconstruction. In 2008, this technology could only be demonstrated through portraits. Zhang Tan used his hands to touch the bones and then used a brush to restore the appearance of the deceased. As soon as he received the case, Zhang Tan began working quickly. On March 17th, just two days after the discovery of the body, the victim's appearance was restored by Zhang Tan. Shortly after that, over 10,000 reports with the victim's portraits were distributed to police agencies along the railway line, and over 40,000 flyers were posted at railway stations. On a late March day, a man named Wang Wenjie from Bangfu City, Anhui Province, contacted the police to report that his brother, Wang Wenda, had been missing for several days. Wang Wenji stated that the portrait drawn by Zhang Tan not only matched the appearance of his brother, but also had a scar behind the neck, which coincided with his brother's. Immediately, the special forces began investigating the situation of Wang Wenda and conducted DNA testing, confirming that the deceased was indeed Wang Wenda. Wang Wenda, 48 years old from Bangfu, Anhui Province, was formerly a construction worker but became unemployed after gambling addiction. He divorced his wife a year ago. According to neighbors, Wang Wenda often went to Kunshan to gamble while he was alive. Wang Wenda had no stable job but relied mainly on gambling, earning all his money by deceiving others with fraudulent tricks. However, it didn't help him escape the cycle of debt. Countless people have tragically died due to cheating in casinos, so is Wang Wenda's death related to causing disputes with other gamblers. Investigators decided to focus on Wang Wenda's gambling associates. The first thing to check was whether Wang Wenda had any conflicts with anyone during this time. But as the investigation went deeper, the case once again hit a dead end when Wang Wenda's gambling associates were ruled out as suspects. The possibility of revenge due to gambling was ruled out. So who could have hated Wang Wenda so deeply that he was brutally murdered? At this point, a confession from a gambler who played with Wang Wenda gave the special team a new lead. Accordingly, on the night of March 10th, Wang Wenda answered a phone call and then left. The caller was his ex-wife named Zhao Suyun, who divorced him two years ago. Forensic examination also showed that Wang Wenda died around March 10th. The police followed this lead to find Wang Wenda's ex-wife. At that time, Zhao Suyun was living in a small house on the outskirts of Bangfu. During the investigation, the police noticed that she showed no concern about her ex-husband's death. However, they found no clues in her house. It was known that Zhao Suyun and Wang Wenda had lived together for nearly 20 years in an unhappy marriage with Wang Wenda, a gambling addict, lazy, abusive, and even adulterous. After the divorce, Zhao Suyun opened a small stationery shop to make a living. During the investigation, the police learned that before ending things with her ex-husband Wang Wenda, Zhao Suyun met another man named Wang Ban, also from Bangfu. Wang Ban, 40 years old, mainly operated motorcycle businesses in Hongkou District, Shanghai. Due to an unhappy marriage and being beaten and abused by her husband several times, Zhao Suyun eventually couldn't stand Wang Wenda anymore and filed for divorce, then later married Wang Ban. However, just when she thought she had escaped from this tormenting husband, he suddenly appeared. Wang Wenda returned, apologized, and expressed a desire to reconcile with Zhao Suyun. Knowing that she had a relationship with Wang Ban, he became angry and often caused trouble. Knowing she was living with Wang Ban, he often came to verbally abuse and disrupt. The neighbors around also confirmed this. So police speculated that a similar situation might have occurred on March 10th, when Wang Wenda came to her house. At that time, there was definitely a conflict between the two men, and perhaps Wang Ban killed Wang Wenda in a fit of rage. However, Wang Ban mostly worked in Shanghai, so if he wanted to kill Wang Wenda, he had to be in Bangfu, right? Surprisingly, when investigating Wang Ban's itinerary, they found that he had spent a considerable amount of time in Shanghai. However, he had set aside a day to return to Bangfu, and that happened to be on March 10th, the day Wang Wenda was killed. The police found no unusual traces at Wang Ban's residence in Bongfu. However, during the subsequent investigation, the continuous coincidences increasingly raised suspicions about Wang Ban. On March 14th, Wang Ban boarded a train from Shanghai to Taizhou. This train passed through the Kunshan area. The next day, the head of the victim, Wang Wenda, was found in the Kunshan section. 
They also found surveillance video at the Shanghai station on March 14th, which showed Wang Bon. At that time, he was clearly holding a bag, seemingly containing a spherical object. In 2008, when the incident occurred, security checks were implemented at train stations. However, during that time, there were often various reasons leading to lax security checks. It's highly possible that Wang Ban exploited this loophole to bypass security checks and continue his journey. And later, the police became even more convinced of their argument when reviewing the surveillance footage. It was clear that when leaving, Wang Ban was carrying a bag, but when he returned to Shanghai around 11 p.m., this time the bag was missing. An interrogation was opened with the suspect, Wang Ban. But when questioned, he flatly denied any involvement. It wasn't until the police found a handwritten letter in his room in Shanghai. The letter was written by him to his daughter, studying in Bang Fu, a confession-like message to his own child. He expressed deep love for Zhao Suyun and admitted to killing his ex-husband, Wang Wenda. At the end of the letter, he hoped his daughter would forgive him for his actions. After confirming Wang Ban as the main suspect in the murder of Wang Wenda, the police immediately searched Zhao Suyun's residence because they suspected it might be the actual crime scene. Initially, they found nothing suspicious. It wasn't until the police searched the bathroom and moved the washing machine that they found a bloodstain the size of a grain of rice. Forensic analysis confirmed that the blood belonged to Wang Wenda. The police immediately arrested Zhao Suyun. After being interrogated by the police, Zhao Suyun confessed to her actions and recounted what had happened. Since she and Wang Ban had come together, she had endured continuous mental torment from her ex-husband, Wang Wenda. He even went to Wang Ban's house and threatened to kill his entire family. After being married for over 10 years, Zhao Suyun knew Wang Wenda very well. His words were never casual. Once he said something, he would do it. Therefore, to prevent any uncertainties, they both had to take extreme measures. They had to proactively escape from the threat of Wang Wenda. How, of course, the only way was to make him disappear from their lives. So, on the night of March 10th, 2008, Zhao Suyun proactively called Wang Wenda and invited him to her place. Then she and Wang Ban collaborated to kill and dismember him. Wang Ban was responsible for diverting the police's attention when transporting the victim's remains onto the train and leaving them at Kunshan. However, he didn't expect that his actions would also be caught by the law. On April 2nd and 3rd, 2008, Zhao Suyun and Wang Ban were arrested. Wang Ban was ultimately sentenced to death for intentional homicide, and Zhao Suyun was also sentenced to death but with a two-year suspension pending execution. Truly, after completing this case, there are many mixed emotions inside me. I feel both anger and pity but also sorrow for the confused thoughts of these two individuals. Clearly, with what Wang Wenda had done, he was utterly despicable, and it could even be said that he was a scourge of society. However, if asked whether Wang Wenda deserved to die, I would answer no. In this world, everyone has the right to live, and this is clearly stated in the constitution of various countries. Wang Wenda did wrong, and the law will punish him. If not now, then perhaps in the future, he will surely pay for his actions. Everything has legal proceedings to ensure fairness and order for society. If everyone like Zhao Suyun and Wang Ban takes matters into their own hands and assumes the label of divine justice or eliminating evil for justice, what will happen to society? In conclusion, everyone has the right to live, to basic citizen rights, and above all, to be protected by the law. Any threatening actions, even encroaching on those rights, are therefore illegal. I hope that after watching this case, we will have a better understanding and thoughtful consideration before deciding on anything. Because sometimes, just one wrong step can lead us down a lifetime of regret. And this is today's case. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? Leave a comment below. Chinese Crimes will continue to analyze real cases in China in the next video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video to support us. And for now, goodbye and see you again.